Americans for Tax Reform, an influential group on the American right, uh, is famous for its former leader, Grover Norquist, saying he wanted to shrink government down to the size where he could drown it in a bathtub. The insurgent libertarianism in today's Republican Party has brought to the fore some politicians who are so devoted to shrinking government that some are even voicing misgivings about government functions we thought basically everyone agreed on now. Things like the protection of civil rights. At the core of the I hate government sentiment that's very fashionable right now is a sort of nostalgia or maybe fantasy about not having government at all. About free people, free families, untaxed, unconstrained by external authority, living according to their religious beliefs and the motivations provided to them by the free market. And which, you know, when you, when you put it that way, it sounds kind of bucolic and awesome, right? When you see it in action in a country that hasn't had a government in about 18 years, it actually looks like this. This is Somalia, from which NBC's chief foreign correspondent Richard Engel has just recently returned. Richard has reported from a lot of war zones and a lot of earthly hell holes in his time as a correspondent. Before we talk with him live here in studio about this trip, I'm going to let him explain in this footage why this particular place right now seems to him to be the single most dangerous city on earth for the people who live there um, and maybe for us here in the U.S. too. Flying into Mogadishu isn't for the faint of heart. On the airport runway sits the wreckage of a crashed plane. It's a fitting first impression in Somalia, which hasn't had a functioning government in 19 years. Our hosts are the 5,000 African peacekeepers here. Their mission is to prop up the Somali government, so weak it only controls a few square miles of Mogadishu. Somalia's president, Sheikh Sharif Sheikh Ahmed, can't go much further than his palace gardens. What we need to do is build our institutions, he says, the basic framework of security and law and order. That's our first priority. Mogadishu today is the most war-torn, dilapidated city I've ever seen. But what's happening here is far worse than just all of these destroyed buildings. The majority of the militiamen terrorizing the city are under 16 years old, teenagers empowered by the chaos to enter people's homes, lash women for dressing inappropriately, and chop off the limbs of accused thieves. Under a thorn tree, I meet 20-year-old Abdelladi and Ismail Abdullah, 18. Both claim they were falsely accused of theft and subjected to the Shabab's radical Islamic law. And then they cut it through. Their punishment, amputation of the right hand and left foot their parents forced to watch. I tried to call out to my mother and say, please, somebody save me, Abdi says. But it wasn't over. The militants returned 15 days later and sawed off two more inches of Abdi's leg just to make him suffer. I have nothing to compare the pain to, he says. The fighting and Shabab terror have created one of Africa's worst humanitarian disasters. 20% of children are malnourished. 25% of families have fled their homes. And there are only 250 doctors left in all of Somalia. But the African peacekeepers say they're powerless to stop the Shabab. The peacekeepers don't go to Shabab neighborhoods. Fighting, they say, isn't their mandate. Our mission to Somalia is peacekeeping. We have not come to go out and engage ourselves in the battle. The U.S. bankrolled the African peacekeepers with $180 million over the past two years and shipped the weak, often unpaid Somali army 94 tons of weapons and ammunition last year. And American weapons are now in action in Somalia under the cover of darkness. At night, we've been hearing the unmistakable sound of American drones circling in the sky over Mogadishu. They seem to be flying very low and make passes every 10 to 15 minutes. American drones searching because Al-Qaeda's Somali branch has attracted American citizens. And for the first time ever, American suicide bombers. 17 peacekeepers were killed when this headquarters was attacked by a suicide bomber last September. But what happened here has direct ties to the United States. Militants identified the bomber as a Somali-American who'd been living in Seattle. U.S. counterterrorism officials tell NBC News around 50 Americans, most of them of Somali origin, 
have come here to fight. Some were recruited by this man, a 26-year-old from Alabama named Omar Hamami, who uses internet videos and rap songs to attract fellow Americans. Our response is martyrdom of victory. The foreign connection is a source of pride for a Shabab commander we interview. Al-Qaeda members are our Muslim brothers. We don't call them foreigners, he says. They're welcome here. You have the combination of capability and intent on the part of an adversary. Capability to strike the United States because they have Americans in country and intent. They've talked about coming after us. As Somalia becomes a springboard for Al-Qaeda that the U.S. has once again been forced to confront. Joining us now is Richard Engel, NBC's chief foreign correspondent. Richard, thank you very much uh, for joining us tonight. I have it's this impulse to tell you to not go to places like this, but I realize it's what you do. Thank you very much. It's good to hear the impulse. <laughs> do the Al-Qaeda-linked groups with Safe Haven in Somalia right now, did they have the capacity to project force outside of Somalia? Could they be an international threat? Yes, and they've already done that. Um, they've sent bombers to Yemen. One of the people who attacked the Danish cartoonist was a Somali who'd received training in Somalia. He'd left Europe, went to Somalia and back. And there's a big concern among CIA, FBI, other intelligence, people in the intelligence community, that people from the United States could go to Somalia, have gone to Somalia, and could return and carry out the attack. They've already expressed the desire to attack the United States. They've attacked uh, regional countries. They've attacked Europe. And many people think they'll come here. And is the attraction of either Americans or people attracted to this form of terrorism from anywhere in the world, is the attraction to going to Somalia the safe haven that these groups are able to operate so freely that they can really operate at a higher operational level? Exactly. If you look at a lot of the videos that are put out by militant groups in Pakistan or Osama bin Laden videos, for example, when he used to put them out, now if you notice pretty much all audio messages, he seems like, and other messages like this, they seem like they're in hiding. You know, they're in a room with sort of a dark background or a flag behind them. In Somalia, they're still out today doing the old calisthenics, running around, operating as if they have a country because basically they do have a country. So it seems safer. It seems more appealing. It seems something that you can actually get in and join the fight, and it's fairly accessible. Most of the people who are going are Somalis and Somali Americans or Somali Europeans. They are still, because of the clan structure in Somalia, tied to the conflict in that country, and there's almost no accountability. You can land at Mogadishu Airport, or you can just get a plane and land anywhere that it's flat. There is no government there, and so it's very hard to, to track people. What is, what is it, what's it like to be on the ground in a failed state? I mean, what, what's anarchy like there? It is unsettling, to, yeah. to put it at the, uh, for, for me or for them? I for mean, you. For me, it was unsettling because if something happens, there's no one to call. No one is coming to help. No police, no fire department. If you get into a car accident, that's it. There's only a few doctors in the entire country. No one will come to help you. No diplomatic representation, no, no reliable government. If you're in a dangerous area in Pakistan, you can call the military or you can call the U.S. Embassy. E even though there can be problem areas and you could get kidnapped or, or some bad things could happen, at least someone will start coming to look for you. In Somalia, there's, there's no one to call. So as, a, as an outsider, that is very unsettling. If you live there, it is absolutely terrifying. And Half of Mogadishu's population is gone now. Uh, they've become refugees. A tenth of all of the Somali population is living outside of the country mm -hmm. just from because of the recent fighting. So it is, um, it is, it is a very, very uh, dis uncomforting feeling to, to have no support at all. The New York Times today front page a story that General Petraeus has ordered expanded clandestine U.S. military operations in places including Somalia, essentially as counterterrorism work. What do we know about, or what do you know, what were you able to report about how much we're actually doing there right now? It's happening. And if you saw in that report, the drones, the drones yeah. we heard it every single night, drones in the sky. Uh, Armed I, drones or surveillance drones? Well, I couldn't tell. Yeah. Um, but there have been drone airstrikes before in Somalia. Mm. So there have certainly been airstrikes against Al-Qaeda uh, Al leaders. The ones I heard, I don't know if they were armed or, or not. But um, in addition to that, there is a lot of contractors that have gone there. Mm. Security contractors, many of them funded in peculiar ways, but basically being funded by the U.S., who are there as mercenaries, as trainers, as advisors. That is, is happening. Just, just today there was a dispute because a whole bunch of German 
contractors, security advisors were on. These are the same types of people who were going to Iraq and Afghanistan in the early days. They are now heading to Somalia. I saw a lot of them. When I was on the plane going in, I was there, another reporter or two, and then a whole bunch of mostly South African people who, you know, tattoos, they, they say, fit the part. Guys with big arms and no insignia. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Uh, it's like Afghanistan and Iraq. One of them is the other war. Then Pakistan is the other, other war. This one is the, 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 the other, the other, 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 other secret war. And yeah. that people don't want to deal with it because of the U history of U.S. involvement there. Black Hawk Down. Richard Engel, NBC Chief Foreign Correspondent. It's always a pleasure to see you here and to see you safe. Thanks for being oh, thank here. You. Good thank to you. see you. It was really a pleasure.